This program is a presentation of University of California Television. Your support makes UCTV's programming possible. Contribute online at uctv.tv slash support. Check out our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, at youtube.com slash uctv prime. Subscribe today to get new programs every week. First session is revascularization of PAD. Uh, on behalf of uh, myself and Peter Snyder, we, we, we welcome you here. Um, the, first, uh, the first speaker is, uh, is, is my mentor, professor, and chief of vascular surgery at UCSF, uh, who's going to give us a lecture on TASC, AHA, SVS, what's happening with the guidelines, and how are they relevant. Mike Conti, thank you. Good morning. If everybody's filtering in, we've got a great uh, program in store for you this morning, and uh, we'll get right into it. So uh, what I'm going to try to do over the next 15 minutes is just give a brief overview of the guidelines that relate to the treatment of peripheral artery disease. We're not going to go through every line item, but we're going to give some big picture stuff, and we'll talk a little bit about how they are or may not be relevant in, in current practice. These are my disclosures. I, uh, I'm on the advisory board for a couple of biological therapy companies. I'm also involved in some of the guideline writing uh, groups, including the SVS and the uh, Task 3 group, and I sit on the PVD Council of American Heart Association. Well, um, this kind of sums it up as far as I'm concerned in PAD. If you think about the different areas of practice we have in vascular disease, aneurysm, cerebrovascular disease, and PAD, it really isn't much, much question that in PAD, uh, it's kind of the Wild West. Pretty much people do anything, anytime to anybody with very little uh, quality evidence to base it on, and the guidelines for practice are pretty limited. And although um, this has actually been good business for the creators and the users of widgets, uh, I would suggest it hasn't necessarily been so great for the patients, and the costs are skyrocketing. It's certainly may not be so good for the healthcare system. So this can't really be the way we go forward. We need to develop some evidence base for the tre treatments we choose, and we need to be able to support that with evidence of effectiveness in patients. Now, the purpose of practice guidelines <clears throat> seems relatively straightforward. We want to be able to, as professional organizations, aid providers in everyday practice with their clinical decision making, um, I think there's, there's a lot of uh, discussion about why evidence doesn't translate into practice, and that's very complicated. It has to do with a lot of things, including reimbursements and, and, and all sorts of uh, and turf issues, but bridging the evidence to practice gap is clearly one of the big goals of, of, uh, of, our, of our profession, I think, and certainly of federal agencies. We want to be able to understand and support best practices in, in the clinic. And I think possibly we can, with uh, practice guidelines, we can streamline care and improve the patient experience. And this may also have ancillary benefits on resource utilization and cost. So just a little bit about how these things come about. They come down from you know, Mount Zion on a tablet. But uh, here's the basic idea. S some group selects a panel of experts. Uh, the approach then is to take a systematic approach and search the literature, uh, synthesize the evidence, possibly using meta-analysis or systematic review or other types of ways of evaluating the evidence. And then basically you grade the quality of the evidence. And based on the grades of the quality of the evidence, you make recommendations uh, either based on evidence where you have it or sometimes just on the consensus of expert opinions. And the difference between those things should be reflected in the strength of the recommendation. And there are several systems that are used out there for, for grading both evidence and recommendation strength. Uh, the AHA has one. There's one called Grade, Oxford, and there's been some modified versions. Again, basically it starts by grading the levels of evidence. And in general, uh, multiple randomized trials and meta-analyses are the highest level of evidence, followed by a single randomized trial or non-randomized studies, and then followed by case studies or 
the consensus opinion of experts based on, on case studies. And then the grade of recommendation that's applied is based on the evidence with the use of consistent phrasing to reflect the strength of opinion. So that's the process. Um, this is the AHA ACC grading system. It's a color-coded system, but just it's, the basic idea is there's three levels of evidence. Again, multiple populations have been evaluated, limited or very limited, and then class one recommendation is very clear that the benefit exceeds the risk, the procedure should be performed. Uh, class 2A and 2B is not so clear, but it looks like the benefit is better than the risk or slightly better, and then it's either reasonable or may be considered. And then if you go out here, there's absolutely no benefit or potential harm. And so each class recommendation is accompanied by the level of evidence that supports it. Okay, so just a little bit about the uh, practice guidelines that have come out in the last five or six years that relate to PAD that you probably are all aware of. In 2005 slash six, this document was, uh, was actually published in 2006 in circulation. It's the ACC AHE practice guidelines for the management of peripheral artery disease. This document is very, very broad. It actually includes renal artery disease uh, and aortic aneurysm disease, but a big part of it is, is what we would call PAD or uh, arterial occlusive disease of the lower extremities. You can see that there's a broad representation from all different societies. It's a, it's a group of senior people from cardiology, radiology, and certainly vascular surgery that generated this uh, guideline, and it's a very broad uh, scope. And then in 2011, just last year, there was an update published. It's a shorter update. It's focused update, uh, only addressing certain areas where they felt they needed to make some changes based on recent studies and we'll go through some of those high points. Both of these were published in circulation as well as in the Journal of the American College of Cardiology. So we're not gonna go through every line item, but I wanted to point out some of the things that are, are probably a little more of interest and, and some that are a little controversial. The first relates to diagnosis and screening of PAD. So the ACCHA guidelines recommend an office-based resting ABI uh, for patients with exertional symptoms, that is claudication, patients with non-healing wounds, and also for patients without symptoms who are 65 or older, or 50 and older with a history of either smoking or diabetes, and they call this a class one recommendation with level B evidence. Uh, and I think this one uh, recommendation, while it's, uh, it's not for an intervention, has generated a lot of controversy. In fact, this has been rejected twice by the United States Preventive Services Task Force based on a lack of evidence that actually would improve patient outcomes and the possibility that it could cause uh, unnecessary treatments and harm. And there's a lot of discussion and debate between the societies about this. Where you stand on this, I think uh, every one of us probably has some opinion. I actually feel like diagnosing PAD is of some importance in getting people to comply with their cardiovascular medications. But like anything else, it depends on how the information is used and applied. They also recommended in the 2011 update that your vascular labs now report ABIs according to this scheme, with 0.91 to 0.99 now being called borderline, and uh, 1 to 1 1.4 normal incompressible greater than 1.4. Uh, they address, they spend a lot of time in this guideline addressing medical therapies and risk factors. Most of this is straightforward and familiar to you. The one change in 2011, based on a couple of randomized trials, they are no longer recommending the use of antiplatelet therapy for asymptomatic PAD patients, that is patients with an ABI of less than 0.9 who have no symptoms. And that's based on a couple of randomized trials that no, not only did not show any benefit, but actually showed some harm. However, for symptomatic patients with PAD, based on a large body of evidence, it is still recommended. Uh, there's been studies that have shown not only no benefit, but some harm to the use of warfarin for PAD. Uh, smoking cessation, lipid lowering, diabetes, and hypertension treatment are, are according to other guidelines. And just again, statins are being recommended for all patients with proven PAD to achieve target LDL levels less than 100 or less than 70 for higher risk patients. They also have a couple of recommendations specific to the treatment of symptomatic classes of PAD, although um, it's, it's fairly bland. Uh, in general, they recommend that the initial approach to the claudicant should be a, a, a recommendation for supervised exercise as the initial treatment. 
uh, there is level one evidence that supports that exercise can improve walking function. They also uh, recommend considering a trial of drug therapy with Solostazole. Uh, this is class 1 level A based on the drug studies that have been done that many of you are aware of showing a consistent though modest improvement in walking performance with the drug. They then uh, go on to make some fairly bland statements about intervention saying that endovascular treatment is preferred for task A, focal lesions amenable to treatment, surgical therapy might be okay for advanced symptoms. If you do a bypass, it should be constructed with vein. For CLI, they actually made an update in the 2011 document based on the long-term follow-up data from the basal trial. Uh, and based on this data, the AHA 2011 guidelines says that angioplasty as an initial therapy is okay for patients with estimated life expectancy of two years or less. And bypass with vein uh, seems appropriate as initial therapy for patients with life expectancy greater than two years. We'll get into that a little bit more later today. Many of you are more familiar with the task guidelines, which are a little bit more oriented towards uh, surgical interventional procedures. And it's, it's probably worth going through a little bit of the history because uh, there's a new version underway and there's a, a lot of increasing interest and controversy about the process. The original task document was published in 2000. This was really uh, on the basis of the efforts of a, a small group of people, particularly Bob Rutherford and John Dormandy. 14 societies from the US and Europe and Canada ultimately endorsed the document. This effort was supported by a grant from a drug company, Shearing, uh, and yielded a, a really broad document that not only made some treatment recommendations, but actually went through a lot of, I think, worthwhile effort highlighting the key questions that needed a lot of, more, a lot of additional study. In 2007, this document was published, Task 2, published in both the Journal of Vascular Surgery and the European Journal. Uh, this now uh, was the effort co-chaired by Bill Hyatt and Lars Norgren, a vascular medicine specialist and a retired vascular surgeon. Fifteen sci societies participated uh, in this uh, or supported this. This was also, it's important to know, supported by pharma pharma pharmacotherapy companies, Sanofi and Bristol-Myers Squibb. Uh, and then the task three effort, as I mentioned, has just gotten underway and their target is to have a new document ready within about a year. So to summarize some of the key task two guidelines as they relate to PAD, uh, they, they basically came out with a very similar stance to the AHA document in, in relation to diagnosis and screening, as well as risk factors and medical therapies. In addition for the treatment of claudication overall, they did say that supervised exercise should be offered to patients initially, and that one should consider a three to six month trial of drug therapy with solostazole before intervention. However, the, gar the, the majority of this document that people have focused their attention to is the recommendations that were made regarding specific revascularization based on anatomic territories. And it's interesting to note that they changed the anatomic scheme from task one. If you're not familiar with it, it's, it's kind of subtle. It's probably not even worthwhile going back and looking at it, but the reasons that it was changed were never really entirely clear. And it, it's a little bit difficult because it's made for a changing uh, a changing scheme to, 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 to look at in comparing these documents. In general, um, they broke this down into aortoiliac disease and femoral popliteal disease, although clearly um, we'll get to this, that that's, that's not the way our patients break down. Uh, but they felt this was the best way to make treatment recommendations, and you're familiar with the scheme. Task A is relatively limited disease, focal stenoses in the aortoiliac system, task B lesions, uh, may include a unilateral common iliac occlusion, but still very, very moderate disease. And then task C and D is becoming more extensive disease with the task D lesions being complete occlusions of the infrarenal aorta or extensive disease of both the common and external iliac arteries. And the general treatment recommendations were that task A lesions, uh, endovascular treatment was the procedure of choice, task D surgery, and B and C was a sort of a spectrum of that depended on the risk of the patient, uh, the patient's preference, and also the operator's success rates. And similarly, for treatment of femoral popliteal lesions, the task A through D scheme is shown on this slide. Focal lesions easily amenable to endovascular treatment. 
more severe lesions, long occlusions, 20 centimeters or greater, or involvement of the popliteal artery. Task D, surgery. Task A, endovascular. B and C is a wide range of everyday practice with really not a strong recommendation. It may be preferred to do endovascular for task B. It may be preferred to do surgery for good risk patients with task C. And again, this has all got to be weighted by uh, provider experience and patient preference and risk. So what are the key limitations in everyday life with TAS-2? I think the focus on segmental arterial anatomy has been uh, a little bit distracting, if you will, and I think confuses some of real clinical decision making. First of all, when it comes to critical limb ischemia, for example, in fact, multi-level disease is common, and the tibial disease scheme in TAS-2 in is, 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 depending on how you read it, is either absent or inadequate at best. And I think the focus really is on lesion characteristics that determine the outcome for endovascular. But for example, things such as vein quality, which really is more important for determining the outcome of bypass, is not even anywhere in the scheme uh, or is de-emphasized. And I think actually the de-emphasis on clinical factors, such as severity of ischemia, presence of tissue loss versus rest pain, and the overemphasis on segmental-based anatomy thinking is really misplaced and has led to a lot of, I think, uh, controversy and poor choices. But I think the other big thing is really today, uh, five years later, there's a lot of question as to whether TAS2 is completely outdated because of evolutions in technology and also changes in practice patterns. You should also be aware that just this December, the European societies published their uh, significant guideline on the treatment of critical limb ischemia in the diabetic foot. This was published in the European Journal as a supplement. It's a five or six chapter supplement. It's actually an exhaustive review of the literature, uh, and it's, and it's well-written. It has sections on the definitions of the problems, the diagnostic methods, risk factors, treatment, and the management of the diabetic foot. Uh, we're not, again, going to be able to go through this whole document, and there are some controversial areas in there. Uh, they recommended bypass with vein for long SFA lesions if life expectancy is greater than two years. This is, again, primarily based on the single basal trial. They did, however, think that PTA was a reasonable initial therapy for infrapopliteal disease, although they said that surgery for, quote, more complex anatomical lesions or in case of persisting symptoms or endovascular failure was appropriate. And again, if bypass was used, it should be an autogenous vein conduit. So to end up here, the current status of these guidelines and the controversies, I think, um, there's a lot of uh, room for improvement here, but the problem really is that the evidence base remains thin. TAS-2 is either discordant, I think, with current clinical practice patterns in our everyday life. There's newer technology and increasing dissemination, and clearly there's a growing volume of endovascular procedures. But the biggest problem in thinking about the next version of TAS is that we really have little new high-quality evidence, uh, and we just have a lot of so-called expert opinion. I think in the background of this tr attempted to improve the guidelines, we're seeing a real lack of consensus across the specialty societies in many areas, which is making this a challenge. The carotid stenting discord is really a highlight of the issues between surgery and the interventional societies. And there was an attempt at a, at a quick update to task two, primarily driven by the interventional groups that failed to get support from the surgical societies. And that's going to be a challenge for task three. And I think the good thing is that there's been increasing scrutiny of the processes behind these guidelines and the potentials for conflict of interest based on the funding. Um, and the big thing also is that the guidelines seem to have limited influence on providers because, in fact, uh, people are still doing uh, whatever I think uh, they're moved to do. And although recent trends from reimbursement agencies and the federal government may be noteworthy in that they will pay attention, I think, to evidence-based guidelines in the future. So finally, the SVS, where, do that, where does that stand? Well, this is still under construction. I hope by the time we are here next year to be able to give you a report on some SVS guidelines. Thanks very much.